Uh, today, it's a particular pleasure to uh, introduce and uh, return to our platform, Sergei Guriev. Uh, I think it's fair to say Sergei is one of the top economists in Russia, uh, runs the uh, best Russian economic school, um, the new economic school in Moscow, where he is president of the Center for Economic and Financial Research, uh, Morgan Stanley Professor of Economics, uh, rector of the full New Economic School itself, and um, I think this is the uh, intellectual institution in Moscow, widely regarded as the top economic school in the country, and uh, Sergei's leadership has been a key element in making it so. Um, he did his PhD at the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, subsequently did postdoc work at MIT, taught at Princeton, and has published very widely in refereed journals uh, uh, around the world for the last 20 years. Uh, he's a member of the uh, advisory committee to the Institute, uh, which I'm very proud of. Uh, he is a co-manager with our own Anders Oslin and Andy Kutchins from CSIS of the Russia Balance Sheet Project that we have been running with CSIS and the New Economic School for several years uh, on the outlook for the Russian economy and particularly the relationship between Russia and the United States. Um, it recently produced a volume uh, called Russia After the Global Economic Crisis. Sergey Anders and Andy co-edited that volume and uh, we're very proud of that as well. Um, Today, Sergei will speak on the topic, as we advertised, the Russian, Russian presidential election, what it means for politics, economics, and particularly given the agenda here in Washington, the PNTR debate that will, of course, be ensuing in the Congress uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, we have in your packet an early version of our new publication on the PNTR issue, Anders and Gary Huffbauer have done a comprehensive analysis of both the economics and the politics of PNTR, a document that we hope will provide a uh, positive base for congressional consideration of the issue uh, and to move it as expeditiously as possible. So with all that as background, uh, it's a great pleasure, Sergey, to welcome you back to the podium at the Institute. We look forward to your remarks and to getting uh, fresh from Moscow uh, what the recent political developments in your country mean for the world, for the U.S., and for trade relations. Sergei Guryev. Thank you very much, Fred, for a generous introduction. I'm, I'm very happy and honored to speak here, and especially, as Fred mentioned, I'm honored to be uh, on the Advisory Council of the Institute. Uh, I will uh, speak for 20 minutes, and then we'll have uh, Anders as a discussant, and we'll be able to take questions. So I'll try to be very brief. Uh, basically, uh, when we published this volume, uh, almost actually almost two years ago, uh, basically, the conclusion of that volume of Russia balance sheet uh, was that in the short run, the situation is fine. In the long run, there are many challenges that have to be addressed uh, in, in the Russian economy. And interestingly enough, two years later, we still stand by this uh, conclusion. And if you look at the numbers, especially if you compare these numbers to Europe or even to the US, Russian macroeconomic situation is great. Russia is growing. Uh, Russia grew by 4% in 2010, in 2011, and will probably grow by 4% in 2012. Uh, Russian debt is still non-existent, something like 10% of GDP. Uh, inflation is as low as uh, it's never been in the Russia's uh, market economy, at 6%. Uh, unemployment is uh, as low as it's never been in Russian history, it's about 6% as well. If you look at all these numbers, things are actually, uh, things are actually great. Uh, but uh, if you look in the long run, in the long run, the situation is actually much more worrisome. And this is what a balance sheet should reflect, right? When we talk about Russia balance sheet, it's not only the profit and loss account, the current 
uh, the current cash flows and current profits, but also the assets and liabilities. And the major liability, of course, is Russia's investment climate. And that's where I will connect to the elections and, and the international relations. Uh, the, in Russia, the words investment climate are usually used as a proxy or sometimes euphemism for um, corruption. Uh, and uh, corruption is now uh, corruption is now the center, uh, the center uh, of the debate between government and opposition, and also within the government. And if you actually look at the economic policy platform of uh, now President-elect Putin, you see that for him the main issue of economic policy is what he calls systemic corruption. And this is exactly right. And the reason uh, for that is even though Russia has enormous investment opportunities, and uh, I see a lot of familiar faces around the, uh, around the room who've actually invested in Russia and uh, made some uh, uh, tangible uh, profits in Russia. Uh, Russia could have done much better in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, and uh, if, if we have time during q and I will go through the list of sectors which are not only oil and gas, uh, where you can make a lot of money in Russia, and that is not happening for a very simple reason, investment climate is not as good. Now, occasionally, uh, Russian government would say, if you look at investment climate rankings like doing business or uh, governance indicators or with the World Bank Institute or Transparency International rankings um, or competitiveness reports, you would say these are subjective rankings. Yes, Russia is ranked in the bottom quartile of countries, uh, but we know Russia is a great and rich country, so these are just subjective indicators. We shouldn't pay uh, attention to them. But uh, this is no longer possible because we can see that investors are voting with their feet. In, uh, uh, although the foreign direct investment in Russia is inward foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment coming to Russia is growing, uh, we also see that outward FDI and also outward capital flows in general are actually growing faster. And in 2011, Russia registered something like $84 billion net capital outflow, which is something like four and a half percentage points of GDP, uh, leaving Russia. And these are mostly uh, funds taken by Russian investors from Russia, where investment opportunities are great, where macroeconomics is good, where economy is growing, to countries in the European Union or the US, where interest rates are low. Uh, you cannot really earn much but uh, the safety of investment and the property rights are probably protected better. And this is exactly the challenge Russia should address because Russia needs to invest in infrastructure, Russia needs to build uh, housing, Russia needs to invest in, in services. All of that is, is a challenge that the government should address. And of course, the, uh, as I said, the central point, the central pro problem in, in, uh, uh, in that debate is about corruption. And that's where presidential election matters. Uh, the campaign wasn't uh, that important, but the protests were concentrated on these issues. The protests, the street protests against, against Mr. Putin were eventually about stealing elections and also about corruption in the government. And I think this, this will continue uh, to be that way. We'll see that opposition will be unified around the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, improving investment climate or fighting corruption, if you like. Uh, and uh, uh, the skeptics would always say, yes, Mr. Putin is promising, uh, promising fighting corruption, but he's not delivered so far in the last 12 years. Why would he be able to deliver this time around? Now, the situation is now changing, and uh, the reason is since opposition is so uh, much or, uh, strong, uh, so, so much stronger and so much better organized, and also credible being a peaceful opposition, I think the government will see the challenge. And we'll see either of the two. Either the government will fear losing power and fight corruption, or government will lose power, and the new government will fight corruption. And uh, uh, I'm optimistic in the long run. I don't know how the transition will happen, because even if government is reformed from within, it will have to dispose of some uh, people who are, are supposedly corrupt and who are allegedly friends of the top political li leaders. So it's going to be painful. If the government is re replaced by opposition, it's also going to be painful. If, if there is a coalition government, it's also something that Russia has not seen for a while. So I think, I think uh, we have a major political uncertainty in the next uh, 
probably a couple of years. And how this uncertainty is resolved, we don't really know. But if you take, uh, take Putin's uh, policy platform uh, as given and try to go through this uh, action points, we'll see a number of things which are going to improve investment climate. And uh, uh, one thing is, which is already happening is uh, Ombudsman for Foreign Direct Investment. Currently, it's Mr. Shuvalov, uh, who is actually addressing the uh, grievances and concerns of foreign investors and uh, proudly puts together a list of, of foreign investors he's actually helped in 2011. The same ombudsman, well, similar ombudsman uh, will be uh, established for domestic investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, there is what's called National Entrepreneurial Initiative, uh, which is uh, actually tasked uh, with going through the list of uh, problems Russia has with doing business rankings or comp competitiveness rankings. Uh, and uh, there is an effort to address each particular, particular regulatory barrier or problematic law or enforcement issue, collecting feedback from entrepreneurs. Uh, so in principle, we see a roadmap. Uh, well, I, sh I should say this roadmap has been put together for many years now. But we see a roadmap to improve business climate and investment climate. And I think actually foreign investors uh, will benefit uh, from that sooner uh, than uh, Russian investors, but still there is a roadmap. Will this roadmap, roadmap be implemented? Will the government uh, walk the talk? I think this is something that uh, is very unclear. As I said, the government is pushed to do that, but uh, it's going to be very painful for this particular government to fight corruption for the reasons I've already mentioned. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this is where the uncertainty lies. Now, what, um, what are the good news? Uh, as I said, uh, there is good news, and uh, Fred mentioned that, Russia uh, joined WTO. Well, Russia made a decision to join WTO, and I expect that Russia will ratify this decision. Uh, and the fact that uh, Mr. Medvedev stays as a prime minister uh, kind of shows commitment from Mr. Putin's side to uh, this project, because WTO is definitely Mr. Medvedev's project. Uh, I, think, I think that will have implications that Russian government didn't foresee. I think Russian government will have to play by the rules of WTO, which will protect foreign investors. Uh, and then there is the next step, which I think is very important, which is uh, OECD accession. Uh, OECD is not EU doesn't have binding rules, but it has a monitoring capacity, and it will shame uh, uh, Russian government uh, on specific issues of governance or corporate governance, whether Russia will not comply with uh, its commitments when Russia is joining OECD. When Russia joins OECD, we don't know, but at least the major uh, bl uh, stumbling block the, uh, the barrier to joining OECD, which was joining uh, WTO, this block is removed, so Russia now has an open road to negotiations. And actually, OECD uh, now thinks that Russia uh, will, uh, will be able to complete negotiations within a couple of years or so. Um, what will be the implications of WTO accession? I wanted to talk about that in detail, but we have David Tarr, who's actually produced almost all estimates for WTO accession for Russia. Uh, and uh, there are various versions of those estimates, short term and long term, uh, depending on um, uh, whether the investment climate implications will be actually, as I said, or not. Uh, and uh, this, uh, these implications will be quite large. Now, not all of them will be within GDP growth, because most benefits will actually go th to consumers. But in the longer run, when investment uh, climate improves due to WTO rules, we are talking about percentage points of GDP every year. So these are substantial, substantial numbers. Now, where does it, that leave us in, in terms of PNTR and, and Jackson Panic? Uh, I think Russia, for Russia, it's a very important symbolic issue. Uh, Russian government is, uh, uh, is uh, humiliated by having Jackson Panic in place. Uh, other than that, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but it also, uh, Russian, Russian government understands very well that once Russia joined WTO, uh, it's a problem of US businesses to remove Jackson Vanek. Uh, because if 
Uh, Russia is a member of WTO, US has Jackson Vanek, and Europeans don't have anything like that, then American business has become uh, less competitive in Russia. And so in that sense, I think uh, Russian, Russian, side, uh, Russian side is actually uh, expecting that uh, U.S. government will, will uh, act on that and U.S. Congress will act on that. Now let me, let me uh, uh, talk about some other good news. Uh, we are talking about uh, foreign direct investment in Russia, and as I said, numbers are growing, but I think um, uh, people usually underestimate how much investment is now happening at the second tier level. Uh, we uh, are now working on a monthly newsletter. We at New Economic School are working together with the Foreign Investment Advisory Council uh, in Russia on a newsletter, uh, which actually reports the progress and the indicators on foreign direct investments in Russia every month. We still don't disseminate this newsletter, but we will. So currently we, we issued a couple of, uh, two, two issues, uh, but uh, we don't disseminate it, we test it. But I myself, I was uh, actually quite surprised to see how much is going on uh, in Russia in terms of foreign direct investment. Now, we also have a section on indicators of investment climates. climate. These indicators have not improved. We also have numbers of uh, capital outflow. These numbers are still quite bad. But uh, there is definitely an optimism on the, on, the, uh, on the foreign investor side. Now, whether this optimism is justified brings us back to the issue I've discussed about investment, climate, corruption, and political issues. And I think here we are in the short run facing a major uncertainty. But in the long run, as I said, uh, we have seen uh, quite a few good news in the last few months. What are these good news? If we asked me half a year ago, if you, or if you actually go back to our book, which we wrote two years ago, uh, this book says the best baseline scenario, baseline scenario is uh, Russia will spend and spend more money, and when oil price goes down, Russia is bankrupt. Uh, that was the baseline scenario. We also said maybe, maybe Russian policymakers will read this book and will wake up and try to reform Russia. That didn't happen. But what did happen, opposition started to protest before Russia ran out of cash. And I think this is very good news, which actually suggests that the reform will happen sooner, either done by the government or by another government. Uh, the other piece of good news is we've always heard the idea that it's either this government or violence and pogroms in the street. And that apparently is not true. The opposition is very peaceful and organized and also not crazy. We uh, see a lot of people in the street, but we see a lot of middle class and reasonable people in the street who, whose goal is not to have a revolution, but whose goal is actually to establish a uh, democratic transition. And I think this is, this is actually very, very good news. Another piece of good news I wanted to bring before, when I was preparing for this talk on Saturday, I, I didn't expect what would happen yesterday, uh, but before yesterday I would say the government is not prepared to shoot. The government is not prepared to uh, switch off internet. I still think that uh, it will not be a major repression, but the government is definitely scared. And also nobody expected the scale of manipulation. The scale of manipulation on Saturday, on Sunday was beyond expectation, and that kind of sends a very uh, worrisome signal. It looks like government itself is not sure how popular it is. Uh, that, that, that is, uh, that is uh, a new variable which, which is probably bad news, but uh, uh, but uh, generally, I think uh, the recent protests and the outcome of the election uh, is, in general, in general, kind of good news, suggesting that there is a peaceful transition which will eventually happen. Uh, my bet is that it will probably happen before 2018, uh, but definitely it's not going to happen in the next year or two. So I, I, I'll stop here on that optimistic note. Thank you very much.
Sergey, thank you very much for bringing us that report and forecast and leading off the session. Uh, as you advertised, we'll ask others to give some uh, uh, lead-off responses, and then he and I will both put a few questions to you, and then we'll open it up to the group. So, Anders, what do you think? Well, uh, I'm, uh, I think that it's a very nice presentation, and of course it's nice to hear that you take uh, the, a very positive uh, view of the situation. I do also, but uh, uh, a few questions immediately come up, so I'll try to give you a few hard questions straight away. Uh, the Russian stock market was, until Sunday, the best performing in the world. Uh, and uh, today, the last I saw was that it had fallen 6%. Apparently, the stock market does not look uh, very favorably upon the situation. Is this a temporary panic, or is it something that you think uh, has a deeper roots? Are we seeing a new start of a capital outflow that uh, uh, you mentioned, or how do you read this situation? Should we pay uh, attention? And uh, something particularly here in Washington that is uh, uh, concerning is that uh, in his big article last month in Moskovsky Novosti, uh, now president-elect Putin came out in just about one of the most anti-American articles that I've seen him doing. It was uh, uh, almost as bad as his uh, February uh, 2007 speech in Munich that uh, shocked us all. Can he really stop this? Uh, anti-American campaign that he started himself, in particular when he has uh, uh, appointed odious characters like uh, Dmitry Ragozin as uh, Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Alexei Pushkov uh, as the Chairman of the Duma Committee. He has the whole apparatus for this uh, campaign. And uh, then the third question, what do, impact do you think it will have on this town when it is preparing to discuss uh, a PNTR for Russia in uh, the second quarter. Impact it will have on? If a discussion of uh, uh, PNTR, permanent normal trade relations for Russia, uh, in which in, uh, here in Washington, okay. which will take place now in the second quarter. Right, uh, Anders, thank you very much. These are indeed very painful questions. As I said, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> uh, as I said, as I said, uh, the uh, level of manipulation came as a surprise. Uh, it's, not, it's not like it came uh, as a complete surprise. I actually, uh, actually wrote an article for Forbes Russia a month ago, and they, it just came out yesterday because Forbes is a very slow publication. Uh, and, there, and there I said the baseline scenario is manipulations will be massive and observers will be everywhere, and they will document this, and, and everybody will be outraged. And, uh, this is, this is what happened, but uh, I, I, I still feel that manipulations went far, uh, they were excessive in the sense that uh, uh, Putin didn't need 64%. Uh, I think, I think uh, Putin would be fine if he just won 55 or 52, or even if my advice to Putin was actually to go to the second round. And I think, I think the stock market uh, interpreted the results as Putin doesn't want to take prisoners. That's, that's kind of a fi figurative expression, right? It's not, it's not a literal expression. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he doesn't want to make compromises. He wants to go all the way. And he wants to reestablish himself as a strong man. And uh, this, of course, scares the markets. Uh, there is an alternative explanation. And you'll see a lot of liberal advisors to Putin to come out and say, uh, Putin wanted honest election. That's why he installed all the webcams. Uh, but uh, people under Putin somehow wanted to deliver good news to him, and that's not Putin, but his advisors. But that's also kind of scary, because that means that Putin doesn't control his own people, and also his own people don't believe that Putin can win an honest election, which is kind of scary for the stock market as well. So I think... Uh, I think uh, the stock market priced in a better outcome. The stock market priced in an honest election, which Putin would either win in the second round or in the first round, but with less manipulation. And that's why the stock market went down. It's a little bit, it's a little bit connected to the capital flight issue. Uh, a lot of people a year ago would say, well, capital flight is continuing because people are afraid of political uncertainty. We don't know who's going to be the next president of Russia. But then when 
uncertainty was resolved and we had Putin as the next president of Russia, capital flight intensified because apparently <laughs> that was this particular resolution of uncertainty that the markets were afraid of and the capital, capital flows were afraid of. So I think there are some resolutions of uncertainty, some outcomes that markets don't like and this was a particular outcome the market didn't like. Uh, I think uh, much depends on the next bit of news, which is uh, uh, government appointment. When Putin appoints cabinet of ministers, I think we will know more. And uh, if uh, there are better people, I think uh, the markets will be very happy. Markets are, working, uh, are looking for good news and uh, cabinet appointments may actually be good news. Uh, currently, I think nobody expects that. So if good news come, that will be a surprise and markets will recover. Uh, so talking, uh, but then in the long run, I, I think everybody is now much more optimistic than just half a year ago. Uh, but talking, talking about anti-US rhetoric, uh, American policymakers are puzzled. Uh, they know that Putin will have to do business with the US. And so they don't understand why Putin is not just in that article, but almost every couple of days he makes an anti-American statement uh, uh, of very high intensity. Statements like Americans don't need partners, they only need vassals. Uh, statements like this is a battle for Russia and American-led opposition wants to dismember Russia. All of, that sta all of those statements are actually being made almost regularly. And I think the uh, answer to that is, uh, and that is actually consistent with what we just saw yesterday and the day before yesterday in the elections and in the, in the streets of Moscow, is that Putin really is nervous about winning this election, was nervous about winning this election. Um, and for him, creating a, an enemy and uh, uh, using the war rhetoric uh, was very important to make sure Russians are mobilized and rally around the flag. So he can say, uh, there is an explanation why corruption is hard to uh, battle. Uh, there is an explanation why things are not as fine as they could be. And the explanation is we have enemies. And uh, that's a convenient enemy. That's the most powerful enemy we can think of. So uh, he appointed US as an enemy. And indeed, in that article you mentioned uh, on foreign policy and security policy, you can actually see that US and NATO are the only countries or institutions that are mentioned as enemies of Russia. No other country or alliance is mentioned. This is kind of scary because we, don't, we, don't, we know that uh, uh, we are not foreseeing any, any conflict anytime soon with these uh, countries or organizations. So, uh, but I think it's used for domestic purposes. And I think generally we will see that Putin will come back to American policymakers and say, Look, I made these statements for domestic use. Let's do business again. Uh, and I think um, part of that we've already heard. A, a foreign, policy, foreign ministry official just said today there'll be a continuity in reset policy. There'll be continuity in maintaining good relations with the US. So nothing will change. And um, the problem, of course, is Russian elite doesn't believe in the fact that US is a democratic country. Uh, Russian elite believes that U.S. Uh, is also a system where you can give your word during the election campaign and take it back. And uh, they will come here and say, look, those were in domestic policy arguments. Forget about them. It's not something that will guide our politics. And the problem, of course, is this is, especially this year in the U.S., uh, at least one side of the presidential debate will, will refer to those statements and will say, look, Putin doesn't like us and Putin is not to be trusted. And I think that is going to be a problem. Uh, and finally, that leads me to the last question about uh, PNTR. I think uh, this is obvious that PNTR is in the interest of American business. Uh, once Russia joins WTO, uh, if Congress doesn't vote on PNTR, it's a statement which is going to be a, an expensive statement for American business. And I hope the Congress, Congress recognizes that. Uh, I'm sure that PNTR discussion will refer to all these anti-American statements by Putin. I'm sure the debate will 
also mentioned human rights violations and uh, the problems with the Russian court system and definitely the problems with the Russian presidential elections. Uh, but I think if congressmen, uh, congressmen care, congressmen, congresswomen care about U.S. national interest, the outcome should be very clear. Sergey, um, we'll have a lot of discussion here, I'm sure, of the details on PNTR. And we want to do that, and I have a couple questions on that, too. But before we do that, <clears throat> I want to take advantage of your unique situation in Russia to ask you a couple of questions about your recent personal experiences. Uh, you mentioned in your remarks that the protesters uh, were not only peaceful, but included a lot of reasonable middle class people. Uh, you and your wife were among those people. Uh, I've seen pictures of you and some of your colleagues uh, in the protest uh, uh, groups. Um, let me ask you about how that feels and what the protesters really want and how you feel that movement will evolve uh, if the manipulation intensifies, perhaps against your expectations. But what's going to be the response of those who have been in the streets, have been feeling that they were making headway, depending on how Putin plays it and how things go? Tell us a little more about that. And in the course of that, how does that relate to the anti-Americanism? Um, is Putin playing to a widespread public attitude that the U.S. is the enemy? Or is it manufactured and conjured up at the elite and presidential level? Uh, what's the relationship between this increasing participation in the governance process in Russia uh, and both the likely outcome of governance itself, which you mentioned a couple of times, but also the relationships uh, with the United States and the rest of the world? Fred, uh, thank you very much. These are also quite difficult questions. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm not a politician, and uh, uh, I, I don't do politics. In Russia, it's very hard to distance uh, personal views from institutional views. Even though the New Economic School doesn't have an institutional position on politics, uh, for the CEO of an institution, it's very hard to convey the message that could be personal view and an institutional view. In Russia, people just don't believe it, and so I don't make political statements. Uh, but uh, these protests were civic protests for honest elections, and I think uh, uh, there is uh, nothing wrong about participating in those protests. Even though some friends of mine in, in the government uh, referring, referring to Mr. Putin's description of these protesters were quite negative on me. Uh, you know that uh, the protesters' uh, sign is a white ribbon, uh, which M Mr. Putin uh, compared to a uh, condom. And so my, my friends at the government directly referred to the white ribbon on my coat as a condom. Uh, and I think, I think these, are, these, are, these are very, it shows kind of the level of debate, right? Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, generally, generally uh, there, are, there are different kinds of protests. <laughs> and uh, there are street rallies for honest elections that uh, bring a lot of anti-Putin people. And a lot of slogans are extremely uh, negative on Putin. Uh, but also there is a lot of feeling of uh, festivity. In a, in, a, in a sense, it's fun. A lot of a lot of, of those slogans are creative and uh, indeed funny, uh, ridiculing Putin and some other some other friends of his. Uh, and people generally go to these protests without an expectations they will be beaten up. Uh, occasionally, parts of these protests uh, violate what Moscow city government allows them to do, and these people are detained, arrested, beaten up quite uh, in, a, in, a, in a quite uh, painful way. Actually, yeah, last night they just broke, uh, broke a, an arm of a lady who is an aide to a member of parliament. And this particular lady, young lady is actually seen as a face of Medvedev's uh, uh, modernization. She's an IT entrepreneur. She's, an ex uh, she's very excited about Skolkova. But then she participated in those protests, and the policeman uh, broke her arm. 
Uh, and uh, that's not fun at all, of course. But a lot of protests are fun, and, and many people are excited about participating in, in, those, in those protests. Um, the, what, what these people want, they want, they, they're insulted by the uh, bluntness of manipulations and fraud. And uh, I, as I said, I expected something like that to happen, but even I, I felt really badly yesterday when I saw the results, the reported results. And I think a lot of people who spend their time as observers and spend the whole day, or more like, I would say, uh, 20 or 24 hours in the election station, uh, are even more insulted. And uh, these people are very unhappy about the fact that they've been robbed. They think about this in, in, as a personal insult. Uh, when you're being robbed in the daylight, and you're being lied uh, in the daylight, and this is what these people don't like. Uh, a lot of these people pay a lot of taxes. Uh, and, and myself, I also pay taxes. And I think that it's an insult that we pay taxes to the police, which then beats us up. Or we pay taxes to pay salaries to electoral commi commission, which steals our votes. I think this is an insult which these people don't like. And uh, we are talking about Moscow middle class, which is quite rich. And this is, this is what these people don't like at all. And so the, these protesters want a reform of political system. There is a big difference between this protest and, say, Orange Revolution in Kyiv in 2004. And the difference is there is no candidate. At least in this particular election, there is no candidate that the opposition wants to defend. Uh, we cannot really come out and say, Mr. Zyuganov would have gotten into the second round unless Mr. Putin manipulated the votes. Uh, protesters don't like Mr. Zyuganov, uh, mostly. And in that sense, these protests are much less focused and much, uh, much less mobilized around one candidate. But I think uh, the protesters are very happy to see that political system is becoming less centralized. And right after December protests, Mr. Medvedev uh, announced that governors are now elected rather than appointed. Regional governors are elected rather than appointed. And the parties will be freely re registered. And presidential candidates are uh, uh, don't need to gather two million signatures to run. So the, there is a major response to protests. And protesters see that the more they protest, the more the government is pressed to do the right thing. And uh, once government starts firing corrupt officials, protesters will be happy as well. So I think, I think uh, there is an understanding that protests deliver, and that mobilizes protesters further on. On the anti-US. And, and, and what if the government decides to stonewall rather than responding in the ways that you and the protesters hope? Uh, I think this is, this is possible, and this is what people are afraid, that the government will just say, you go and protest, we will do nothing. I think uh, the government is, uh, has already shown that it's very much afraid of protests. And, uh, uh, for example, on Sunday and on Monday, they brought uh, about 100,000 policemen to Moscow. It's, uh, Moscow looked like it's occupied by some kind of military force. And uh, you see that government cannot really neglect this protest. For wh why is that? I don't really know, but the government is afraid. And also, in Moscow, weather matters. Right? Uh, there was a protest in February when it was zero Fahrenheit and still tens of thousands of people showed up. But it's much easier to show up when it's plus 20 centigrade, <laughs> or 70 Fahrenheit. Uh, and uh, that season is coming. That season is coming, and so most, uh, the, the, the government is very unhappy. Now, everybody is afraid of, of the crackdown, and that is, that is a scary scenario. Uh, and the, the answer to that is, Protesters believe in Facebook uh, because if you register on the Facebook page and you see that there are 100 protesters to show up, then everybody knows police will come and beat up everybody. If there is uh, 20,000 uh, participants who registered and are, are coming to the square, uh, the police will not be able to beat them up. So I think, I think there is a, there is a major, major difference. Uh, and the Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are extremely powerful tools. And I'm personally, I'm surprised the government didn't go Chinese way and didn't turn off the internet in the way Chinese did. 
I'm, I'm, I'm actually personally surprised, and I think that follows from Mr. Putin's lack of appreciation of the power of internet. Uh, maybe his advisors will, will tell him that uh, he needs to do that now, but looks like they also are telling him that's too late. But anyway, so coming back to your second question on anti-American um, attitudes, I think uh, uh, that is a function of um, uh, censorship. I think uh, Mr. Putin can turn on and off campaigns. So for example, Moscow mayor was fired in uh, September 2010. Uh, he was extremely popular in Moscow before September 2010. And his attitude was, who is this President Medvedev to criticize me? I'm a popular politician who won elections in Moscow many times, and Moscow citizens like me. And then it was a one week of uh, unlimited propaganda against him as a corrupt person, as a husband of a corrupt person. Uh, and uh, nobody demonstrated for the poor mayor. And uh, that shows that government can use media policy to turn on and turn off uh, campaigns. I think generally Russians don't really have an anti-American sentiment. But in the recent months and years, I should say, that was a strong anti-American propaganda on TV. Let's compare it to 2001, when uh, Mr. Putin genuinely was interested in cooperation with the US after 9-11. And US, I should say, has done a lot in Russia's national interest fighting Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Uh, at that point, Russians were in favor of Russia-American relations. And uh, in that sense, there is no intrinsic anti-American sentiment. And of course, protesters are the people who uh, don't get their news from TV. The protesters traveled, traveled abroad. So that group is definitely lost for Putin's propaganda. But generally, the current sentiment is the TV, the TV is projecting the message that protesters are on the payroll of State Department. Uh, personally, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and uh, that is, of course, uh, part of this fun which is in the protest because people in the, in the protest are making all kinds of jokes. But there is an indication that it's not true because all these jokes are in Russian. And as much as we know Hillary Clinton doesn't speak Russian, so these jokes are addressed probably to Putin rather than to Hillary. <laughs> uh, and another, another indication which is obvious is government hacked emails of opposition leaders. Government uh, published uh, transcripts of, tele well, actually audio files of telephone conversations of op opposition leaders. And there are many funny things in those transcripts. But there is no trace of uh, Hillary Clinton paying, paying the salaries of, of these people. So I think uh, once censorship is removed, and this is one of the key requirements of, of the protesters, I think uh, that will be a very different sentiment. But as I said, anti-American sentiment is very important for Putin's electorate. And Putin wants, uh, wants to make sure he is considered to be the only guy in the world who stands up to the US, for example, in Syria. Right? And uh, that is the message he wants to send to uh, Russians who get their news from state TV. Let me ask you one technical question on PNTR, and then we'll open it up. Um, you've now mentioned a couple of times the uh, sequence of events after Russia joins WTO. And if the US does not eliminate Jackson Vanek, you've then said humiliation uh, uh, to Russia. But of course, Russia could still extend to the United States all the benefits of its WTO obligations. It has the right to disqualify US firms under the WTO law if the US does not eliminate Jackson Vanek. So are you sure, I take it you're predicting, that if the United States does not eliminate Jackson Vanek, Russia would take advantage of its opportunity under WTO law to deny the new rights to the United States. But as I say, it doesn't have to do that. So how serious is the practical aspect of the problem uh, that we're facing? Uh, Fred, it's, it's a very good question. And I think um, 
as I said, for Russia, Jackson Vanek is a symbolic problem rather than a real problem. In the recent years, as you know, uh, Jackson Vanek, in practical sense, didn't really matter. Uh, every year it was appealed. Huh? But, uh, uh, and in that sense, it's very hard to estimate how important th this is going to be for domestic policy. And I think from business side, of course, it's in Russia's interest to, to do what you just said. Uh, but uh, for symbolic reasons, Russia can come back and to, uh, well, Russian leaders can come back to state TV in Russia and say, uh, Americans are building missile defense in Europe and they are not appealing Jackson Vanek. Uh, Americans are bad. And, uh, and it may be important for domestic purposes. So it's very hard to predict. And actually, I think the, 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 the decision here actually depends on how nervous the government is uh, in terms of support within Russia. So as I said, even business, not even talking about foreign relations, but business relations are second, second order to being uh, in charge within the country. So if you can secure more support domestically, that's what the government is interested in compared to other things. But I, I fully agree with you, it makes perfect sense for Russia to extend uh, WTO, uh, WTO benefits to American companies as well. Anders, anything further? No, I think we should open up. Okay, let's open it up to the audience, and uh, I'll ask you to either go to the standing mic in the back or use the traveling mic to be brought around, identify yourself, and fire away. Uh, yes, sir, uh, maybe go to the standing mic. Um, Dr. Gray, F. Jim Collins um, at the Carnegie Endowment. Um, you've described um, the protest movement as having forced a certain degree of opening up of the political process, potentially, electing governors and so on and so forth. Um, can you give me any sense for what, to what extent those leading the protests or those who hope for change are actually organizing to take any advantage of that? In other words, are we seeing new parties emerge? Are people beginning to work to organize campaigns to win a governorship? In my experience, that was always the weak point, but I'd like your opinion. Jim, uh, it's a very good question. I, I fully agree. And, uh, and uh, my prediction is there are two outcomes. One is uh, uh, Putin announces parliamentary elections in a year or in two years. That will create a natural platform for protesters to build new parties, register new parties. Uh, and I think this protest movement will split into several parties. Uh, say, nationalistic party, left party, right, well, liberal party, maybe five liberal parties. Mm -hmm. Liberals always like uh, many parties. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but at least that will be a debate and a platform because, as you rightly said, right now, uh, if you ask protesters, what happens if Putin somehow resigns? What would be your economic policy? Uh, what would be your social policy? What would be your foreign policy? And you'll have 10 different answers, right? And that's okay to have different opinions, but we want to have parties, platforms being shaped and, and uh, in some sense personalized. And uh, that process will happen if uh, uh, Putin announces extraordinary parliamentary elections in a year or two. Uh, I think that will happen. There are many people who believe it's not going to happen, uh, but we'll see. There is an alternative scenario. Suppose it doesn't happen. Uh, then there is an obvious thing for opposition to do, to run an alternative election or a primaries without an official election. So the opposition uh, can actually run a, an election online with signing in electronic signatures from voters. And actually have a primaries, both parliamentary and presidential. So it'll be say 10 or 20 million people or 5 million people, we don't know how many, who would participate in such an election. And we'll see that say left-wing party gets 3 million votes, liberal party gets 2 million votes. And then we see that the, say Mr. Navalny becomes the presidential candidate. That will have no formal legitimacy whatsoever, but it will have, region, uh, will have real legitimacy 
because these elections will be run in a fair way. Uh, that will require some funds, but opposition is uh, richer than we thought. Middle class is outraged and will donate some money. So I think this scenario is completely feasible. Nobody's talking about this scenario so far, but I think it's a natural way to, con uh, to maintain momentum. Because as I said, protesters lack a cause. And uh, that will be a, an easy cause. So that will be a, a, a reason to continue debate, uh, continue discussion about future of Russia. So that would be, that would be uh, uh, another, another, another uh, uh, cause to do. Uh, but I, I would think that it will still uh, be accompanied by general protests every month, I think, or every couple of weeks about, about honest elections. Sergey, I'm sure you know there's something somewhat similar going on here in the United States now. The Americans Elect Movement is doing an online convention yep. to nominate an alternative slate for our presidential election. Yep. So it's more directly engaged, but it's using the same techniques that Absolutely. you suggest. So uh, depending how they come out here, they'll probably be ready to export their technology. And <laughs> well, the, Russian, uh, the, the Russian protesters include a lot of people in the middle class who are IT entrepreneurs and who, who are already working on they that. They know all about it. And the leading Russian opposition uh, um, blogger, Mr. Navalny, has been very successful in retail fundraising over internet. So I think, I think uh, uh, that is qu quite possible to happen. And unlike, unlike, unlike the US, where you also have alternative system of nominating and electing officials in Russia, that would be considered to be the honest channel. Dieter? Thank you. Uh, Dieter Detke, Georgetown University. Uh, question is, how serious do you think uh, electoral, uh, electoral fraud is? I mean, it was a real issue in December. Then Putin tried to preempt the issue by putting in web cameras and all that. The only story I heard was that there were some suspicious uh, trucks in Leningrad, uh, in, in Petersburg, sorry, Petersburg, I believe. And that's an old trick, of course, to use the uh, soldiers and the military to make up for maybe missing votes in certain districts. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that? Is it a serious issue, or is this going to be taken care of? Thank you. Uh, it's a very serious issue. And uh, if you read Twitter or Facebook, uh, you see thousands of violations. The suspicious trucks were in thousands of Election, electoral stations, and these trucks would vote in one station, go to another one, to another one, and to another one. Uh, and this is what webcams could not prevent, right? Webcams can count how many people came to the ballot box, and then you can compare that to the number of ballots you find in the ballot box. So some people came with 10 ballots. That is you, something you can uh, discover, and actually it was discovered in some cases too. Also, uh, webcams by law, should, uh, were installed also to monitor the process of counting the ballots after the, the voting is done. That didn't happen in all uh, stations. But what webcams cannot do, they cannot really uh, monitor the process you just mentioned. So uh, a, the same person votes in this station, in that station, in that station. That is illegal. This is a criminal offense in Russia. And yet it happened. And there is now evidence of that. And um, that is what webcams cannot do. And I think uh, we will know in the next few days how big that was. And uh, uh, one mathematical, well, statistical, but not legally binding method is actually to build a curve of uh, the, the relationship between turnout and outcomes. And for all candidates, there is a, a, a bell-shaped curve, normal distribution. Uh, for Putin, of course, it's just a linear, increasing linear shape. And, uh, and that's been the case for United Russia as well. And that kind of gives an opportunity to, to estimate the abnormal part of voting. And that, that's something that will be done already this week. And I, I will not be surprised if, if we see the numbers like 15% or something. So we are talking huge numbers. And, uh, and some people would say that wouldn't change the outcome of the election. 
And I think uh, look, judging by the level of manipulation, it looks like the government wasn't really sure about that. The government didn't have to have a second round, a runoff, probably because, because uh, they weren't sure about runoff as well. So I think, I think the level of manipulation, these suspicious tracks in every city, even in Moscow where every station has observers, some of these observers were kicked out, some of, the, uh, of these observers were not allowed to do what they were supposed to do. So we are now talking about something like 4,000 violations. That's a, that's a lot of violations. We still have something like 100% turnout and 100% Putin votes in Chechnya. And Chechnya did not report numbers for something like 10 hours later. So we are talking about massive, massive fraud, which if we think Putin is popular, Putin would not need. So I think, I think this is beyond, beyond anybody's expectation. And uh, that will reinforce protest movement, of course. And a lot of people in the street just don't believe Putin is a legitimate president. As far as I know, by the way, Mr. Obama has not congratulated Mr. Putin so far as well. Yeah, so he's, uh, he's not sure about that. So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for excellent presentation. My name is Jana Angriter, so I'm faculty at the University of California. I'm visiting Georgetown and size John Hopkins. So um, you presented us with very optimistic uh, picture of foreign direct investments uh, developments. And I was wondering if your assessment uh, applies to all sectors, because um, I'd like to comment, I'd like you to comment on the developments in the banking sector. We all know that um, after 1998 Russian financial crisis, uh, many uh, private banks were nationalized and currently the banking system is uh, dominated by state-owned banks and uh, we know that um, the presence of foreign banks in the Russian banking sector is very limited and there are quite you know, few restrictions on foreign bank entry. And I was wondering, uh, what do you think are the implications of the current ownership structure for the financial stability of the Russian banking sector? And what are your um, expectations with regards to the, um, um, uh, you know, abolition of restrictions or um, developments uh, of foreign direct investments in the banking sector? Thank you. It's a it's a very good question. First of all, um, let me say that there is a sector where foreign investors were badly treated, but also Russian private investors as well. This is electricity sector. When Russia privatized generation capacity in electricity, uh, this. Uh, Russian investors and foreign investors paid a lot of money, and then Russia walked away from its commitments to liberalize the market. And actually, about a year ago, we had a meeting with Mr. Putin, and I said, uh, there are a few things that Russian government, where Russian government didn't deliver on its promise, uh, corruption, inflation, and this. And he said, corruption, don't worry. Uh, there'll be zero corruption in Russia. He didn't say that. <laughs> on inflation, he said, we promised 7% this year, we will deliver, and he delivered or central bank delivered. Uh, and on electricity, he said, you should understand, we cannot really deliver on this. He said, we just cannot afford letting market uh, determine prices in the electricity market. And that, of course, was a direct blow to foreign and Russian investors in this particular industry. Uh, so I'm not optimistic about that sector. Uh, but coming back to foreign banking, uh, here, I think there, the, there is no issue of restrictions. Restrictions exist, exist, but they're not binding. They're just not binding. This is a simple matter of fact. And a lot of foreign banks quit. It's not an issue of foreign banks unable to come. It's a, an issue of foreign banks unable to stay. Some of that is driven by the need to recapitalize their home operations in Europe. Some foreign banks have to sell to make sure they exist. Uh, and some banks just cannot compete in Russia. And the reason for that, as you rightly said, state banks. Now, I have to disclose I'm a board member of Sberbank. And uh, I think Sberbank has done very well in recent years, increasing efficiency. Uh, that is actually true. That's been a, a, a major effort to overhaul the bank. The bank is run much, much better, much more efficient. But of course, it's also a monopoly. In a sense that in many, many small towns and, and distant regions, the Sberbank controls the vast majority of retail market. And so it pays very little on deposits. 
to its depositors, and so it pretty much has a huge margin. It's very hard to compete with Sberbank. It used to be easier, but now when Sberbank is more, much more efficient, it's very hard. And uh, that's why some banks actually quit. Some foreign banks quit. It's not an issue, it's not an issue of, of um, uh, uh, restrictions. Now, what's going to happen? Uh, well, Mr. Medvedev, last June, said Russia will privatize everything. And if you read his speech, you really see that in banks, Russia will privatize everything. So Sberbank will be 100% private. Since then, Sberbank postponed even the privatization of a minority stake. So the government responded to Mr. Medvedev, still President Medvedev, that privatization will happen sometime until 2017, uh, which in Russian terms probably means we don't know when. Uh, and in that sense, I think, uh, I think this is a very uncertain scenario. But once Sberbank is private, I think it will be much easier to regulate it. And as a board member, I'm unhappy about that. But there is also a project, which I think is a very important project, to build a postal bank in Russia. Uh, so Sberbank has 20,000 branches. The Russian Post has 40,000 branches. And if there is a private bank, foreign or Russian, or is a, it, there is a joint venture of a Russian private and foreign bank to build a, a postal bank that will be a major competitor to Sberbank. And still, I should say that uh, once European banks and American banks are feeling better at home, there are still huge opportunities in Russia in niches that Sberbank still cannot cover. I think that is, uh, that is clear that Russian financial market will grow because Russia is still very much underbanked. There are many services that don't, don't exist. So I think, I think uh, a lot of foreign banks will come back. But it's not an issue of regulation or... or Sergey, when I think about the examples of Japan, China, India, and a few others, I have to say it's a breathtaking proposal to create a postal bank, bank to increase competitive pressure <laughs> and reduce monopoly. But, but they don't have. But, but they maybe, don't have Sberbank. They don't have Sberbank. Well, but, 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 but maybe in Russia it will work, John. <laughs> Thanks, uh, John Lipsky from the Nietzsche School for Advanced International Studies. Uh, you mentioned two things at the outset uh, that were surprises. One that your your book had mentioned that you mentioned that your book had anticipated declining oil prices and therefore fiscal pressures in Russia. And in fact, what, and you also described a very good uh, macroeconomic situation for the last few years. Uh, obviously, high oil prices had the major, it was the major contributor to that. Uh, but also, uh, it's widely viewed that Alexei Kudrin uh, was a positive force for restraining uh, the pressures for ever increasing fiscal spending. That it could have been uh, much that uh, fiscal policy could have been much less uh, balanced than it was, or much less disciplined than Could it was. Could you say it again? W which was a restraint? What was a restraint? Kudrin, Kudrin the Minister finance Kudrin. minister. Alexei Kudrin. Oh, okay. Alexei Kudrin. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, he quit, as you know, and uh, flamboyantly. Uh, so, question one: Is that a fair representation of uh, that there were great pressures for? much more expansionary fiscal policy that were resisted, and more importantly, given that oil prices are very high now and are likely to stay uh, high for the near future, is the new Putin government going to restrain fiscal spending and maintain discipline or lose control? John, very, uh, uh, th thank you very much. It's a very good question, and uh, in short, I should say yes. Mr. Kudrin was a very important uh, force restraining spending. And uh, when he's gone, everybody's worried about this very issue. And he uh, combined three qualities which are very rare in Russia. He was, a f and still is, a friend of Mr. Putin, who could actually stand up to Mr. Putin and say, I think you're making this or that mistake. There are very few people in Russia who can do that. Uh, second, uh, he's smart and professional. He knows what he's talking about. And third, he has a backbone. So he, he wants to do things he believes in. He's much less flexible or opportunistic, whatever word you want to use. And when you think about these three, three qualities, they're very hard to find in one single person in Russia. And uh, I don't know who's going to replace him now. There is an interim replacement who is not a friend of Mr. Putin. So. 
uh, effectively, I think what's going on now is when the current finance minister needs to talk to Mr. Putin, he would ask Mr. Kudrin to do something. But uh, that cannot last forever. And in that sense, I think everybody's worried about fiscal situation. But also Mr. Kudrin has managed to build a consensus in the economic policy making uh, and think tank community and in the Ministry of Finance itself. So I think currently, uh, at least in the interim stage, in the interim stage, there is a debate that Russia needs budget rules, fiscal rules, that would indeed link spending to oil price, or actually delink spending from oil price. Uh, and uh, so far we see that President Medvedev is in favor of that. But to what extent it would be Mr. Putin or Mr. Medvedev uh, who will uh, be in charge of fiscal policy, we don't know. And I also think that uh, so far Mr. Putin uh, has been functioning as a person who believes that most political problems can be resolved by more spending. And so in that sense, everybody's very worried about, uh, about uh, higher spending. So with Mr. Kudrin gone from the government, I think uh, uh, everybody is asking the very same question we did. Andres? Yeah, can I follow up on this? Uh, there are two personalities that are discussed now, in particular outside of the government. One is Kudrin, for the reasons John mentioned, and the other person is Mikhail Prokhorov. After all, he stood in the election, prime minister. Uh, uh, and he came now with 9% uh, of, of a vote, and uh, uh, he is uh, the person that uh, the old liberal position uh, Parnas and so forth are uh, turning to uh, and of course people are now asking is he likely to be the Prime Minister after Medvedev has been there for a short uh, period? Uh, will Putin be prepared to integrate uh, Prokhorov into the political uh, process? Uh, what do you think about that and also a bit more a bit more broad terms what do you think will happen to the government? There seems to be a total uncertainty about what kind of government uh, there will be now. What are your thoughts? I, uh, I think that there is an uncertainty and only Mr. Putin knows who's going to be in the government. I think that Mr. Medvedev will be appointed prime minister. How long he's going to last, I don't know. But he's definitely going to be appointed prime minister and that's as much as we know, I think. I think uh, and that also is something that, as, as I said, can positively surprise the markets. I think now markets price in reshuffling, but no real change in the government. So people moving from the uh, presidential administration to the cabinet of ministers and people moving from cabinet of ministers to presidential administration. That's what the market prices in. And I think if there are new strong faces, then I think market will be positively surprised. Mr. Prokhorov will only be a prime minister if there is a coalition government in the sense that the prime minister will be independent of the president. And I think so far Mr. Putin is not prepared to do that, but that may change. Mm. So you see it as an option? He said, no way I'll be a dependent prime minister. Mm. He publicly said that a few times. And Mr. Prokhorov is a person who values, uh, he delivers on what he says, which is costly, but also singles him out as, a, as a one of the few people who are who are known for that, as well as actually Mr. Kudrin, who just said that he doesn't want to be a prime minister. But things may change. Okay, further questions? Uh, two back there, uh, Finley and then Dick. Uh, this is a little bit speculative. Please identify. Uh, Finley Lewis, CQ, Congressional Quarterly. This is a little bit speculative, but it's unlikely that Congress will eliminate Jackson Vanek uh, in isolation. That is that I think there's enough nervousness on the Hill uh, about being seen as, give, as doing a favor for, for, for Putin that they're going to want some kind of political cover. And what you hear talked about up there uh, is a bill uh, introduced by Cardin and uh, Congressman McGovern called the Accountability for Sergei Magnitsky Act. You're smiling. I think you know it's coming. What would what would what would that do? What would the impact of that be 
uh, in Russia. How would Russia uh, react to that? So that on the one hand, uh, Jackson Vanek is written, is eliminated from the books. On the other hand, there's something which is much more in the present tense, uh, which would impose sanctions on anybody who had their fingerprints, for example, on Magnitsk Magnitsky's death. Uh, what, what, what would the impact of that be? That's a very good question, and I think, uh, and I think uh, it's very clear uh, how Russia considers the Magnitsky Act. And I think uh, uh, by observing what has happened to the Magnitsky case after his death, we can certainly say that the top political leadership doesn't want to prosecute people who have, as you said, fingerprints on the Magnitsky case. And apparently, that started a long time before uh, death of Magnitsky when Bill Browder was denied his visa. Apparently, that decision was taken very high up. And uh, from public statements of Mr. Kudrin, we know that he went to Mr. Putin asking him, asking him to give visa to Bill Browder, and that didn't work. Uh, that means that some very uh, high-ranking officials uh, didn't like Mr. Browder and further on uh, uh, had something to do with Mr. Magnitsky. Uh, that is an issue which is much less personal for Putin than Khodorkovsky's case. But Magnitsky's affair uh, was an affair where Medvedev ordered an investigation and nothing happened. And uh, I think that suggests that people who are involved somehow are connected to some very high up, the people who are very high up. And these people are extremely nervous about Magnitsky Act. So if you think about Magnitsky Act and uh, Jackson Vanek or status quo, we don't care about Jackson Vanek anymore. I think, I think a lot of people hate the idea that there will be a Magnitsky Act and people will hate the idea that um, this will also be done in Europe because it hits corrupt officials at the very core of their model, of their world. If they are not able to travel, if they are not able to access their uh, foreign accounts, then why take bribes? So I think, uh, I, think this is, I think this is something that Russian government is very unhappy about. And uh, they will do whatever, they, whatever it takes to, to prevent that from happening. And they will retaliate. retaliate. So whoever puts uh, Mr. Boot in jail will not be able to ac uh, access their accounts in Sberbank and travel to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small category. <laughs> yeah, I'm Dick Smith, a former Foreign Service officer. I want to ask a question about a longer term systemic problem that Russia faces. Russia, like much of the developed world, including Europe, is facing declining fertility rates, a lowering of the uh, lifespan. Uh, and it seems to me that, like many other countries, but perhaps to a greater degree, they're going to require increased immigration over what they had before and an ability to integrate immigrants into their economy. And I'm wondering if people, policymakers in Russia, are aware of this problem and are thinking about it and if anything's happening that might respond to it. Dick, this is a very important question. There are a number of issues in that question. One is fiscal, the pension system, uh, which I think, uh, I think has to be addressed as a fiscal issue. And uh, so far it's not been addressed, and the government said we will not raise retirement age, and now I think that everybody knows that we will have to raise the retirement age, otherwise the current pensioners will not be paid. Uh, so now there is a search of wording that will be consistent with previous statements by Putin, we will not raise retirement age, and yet this wording will be consistent with raising retirement age. So I think there is a, a now a, a search for a model to reform the fiscal system. Uh, on the life expectancy in general, so part of the problem with Russian demographics is a low life expectancy on, of males. So Russian women live as long as women in similar countries, Russian men just three years ago, lived 10 years shorter. Now this gap has decreased, and it will decrease further because much of this gap is due to uh, binge drinking and smoking. And Russian government needs cash, and Russian government will tax alcohol and tobacco. 
Uh, I'm actually very happy to talk about that because we as a new economic school did a lot of research on these issues, uh, measuring elasticities, measuring fiscal implications, but also we measured the political support for raising tobacco prices. Uh, Putin's problem was he didn't want to offend yet another part of Russian society. He thought there would be protests against high, high, against high alcohol and high tobacco prices. Um, some people would say that uh, people who control vodka business in Russia are close friends of Putin, but I think yeah, the, the, that, that is something that is probably not clear whether it matters in his decision making or not. But um, uh, we did research and it looks like even smokers support higher prices because they want to quit. Uh, <laughs> and in that sense, I think uh, male ex life expectancy will go up. Uh, that will create further fiscal problems because then male will uh, claim their pensions. Males will claim, claim their pensions. <laughs> uh, but then the immigration issue, you're right on target. This is extremely painful. Uh, Russia is not a tolerant society. Uh, we did research on how many immigrants would move to Russia and uh, whether it's going to be enough. And our estimates are that if Russia doesn't have draconian immigration laws, then, and I think that's a baseline scenario because business needs people. Uh, I think, I think uh, so our estimates are that uh, Russian population bottoms out in 2020 or 2025 and starts growing. And uh, by then, Russia will be an immig immigrant country like Canada or Australia with 20% of foreign-born population. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be very painful. And right now in the opposition, there is a substantial part of opposition that hates that happening. And uh, I think uh, it will be a major political issue in the coming 10 or 20 years. Right now, this debate is burdened by corruption because what happens, um, a lot of immigrants are exploited by corrupt cops, by corrupt policemen. And, uh, and that is, and they bribe their way through. And so once corruption is eliminated, that will be much easier to deal with. Currently, it's also, it's, it's very hard to separate corruption issue and ethnic nationalism, but it's going to be very difficult. I think it's one of the, as you rightly said, one of the major uh, long-term challenges, but government doesn't do much about that. Scott? <clears throat> Thank you for the very insightful presentation. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I'm with Procter & Gamble. Um, <clears throat> we obviously have a big, pretty successful operation in Russia. We have about 4,000 Russian employees, but part of our success is uh, being an American company and being having, uh, having Western or American brands for sale. I would, let me ask a deeper question uh, that's on my mind about the anti-American rhetoric. First, is it believed by the, by the Russian public? And second, do you think that might have any effect on American companies doing business in Russia in terms of how they're perceived, how their products are perceived? Scott, this is, I think, I think you've answered this question when asking the question. Uh, when you choose between American brand and Russian brand, generally Russians would prefer an American brand. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a general understanding that American companies are not corrupt or at least much less corrupt than Russian companies. Uh, usually it's believed that people who work in American companies uh, are less corrupt and uh, these people are also better trained. So if you ask a government official whether he wants his kids to work in Sberbank or Goldman Sachs, there is no doubt Goldman Sachs is better. I, with all the conspiracy theories. <laughs> uh, I think, I think uh, there is no question about that. So I think that is, that is very clear. If you, for example, you buy a life insurance policy with all the problems with AIG in recent years, I think, uh, again, there is no question that you'd probably buy an, uh, a life insurance policy from an American life insurance company. If you think about healthcare, Russian government officials are very patriotic, but they go to Swiss hospitals, Israeli hospitals, or American hospitals. Uh, and uh, there is an operation owned by uh, Russians in, in, in Moscow called European Medical Center. It has French doctors, but it's owned by Russians. And the very, the very, the very word European Medical Center 
actually it's very important to its uh, success so I think I think uh, at the personal level Russians would rather drive American cars than Russian cars but uh, don't fund the opposition once you start funding the opposition I think that will be a problem <laughs> <laughs> well you can fund the university stuff <laughs> New economic school in particular. <laughs> My name is Carol Colling with Eurasia Group. And just a follow-up question on Prokhorov. Um, if you could maybe just talk a little bit about what you think his future political career might look like. He's announced that he wants to form a political party. He had an unprecedented showing, especially given that he didn't have a political infrastructure in place and the overall negative Russian uh, views toward oligarchs. So it seems like he could have really been one of the clear winners of this election. So. Do you see a future, a political future for him? And to what extent will he be able to capture uh, part of the protest movement in that, in that vote going forward? Thanks. Thank you. Um, we don't really know. I spent quite a bit of time talking to Prokhorov uh, about his policies, uh, policy positions and about his personal plans, and I still don't know. And I think, I think uh, for him, uh, I think he kind of, believes that he cannot really achieve more in business than he's achieved already. And so he's lo uh, looking for a new career, and that looks like an obvious career. Uh, I think he underestimates the baggage from 1990s, uh, but uh, he is a very reasonable and smart person, so he knows that, that this baggage is costly to him. Uh, his economic program makes sense. His political program is actually very, very, uh, uh, reasonable and very anti-Putin, I should say. He refrains from uh, making personal anti-Putin statements. Uh, he won so many votes this time, and he knows that, uh, because uh, the choice was so limited. Uh, so all the middle class couldn't really vote for anybody else but for him. And uh, I think if the votes were not stolen, he would probably walk away uh, with 15% of the vote. And he actually carried Moscow as a second. In many, in many poll stations, he actually beat Putin in Moscow. So we don't know what the honest campaign outcome would be. Uh, but even, even with this counting, he is second in Moscow, second in St. Petersburg, second in Yekaterinburg. So, uh, I think if there is an honest campaign, Mr. Navalny would, be, would beat Mr. Prokhorov, uh, provided they have the same funding, which is, of course, a problem for Mr. Navalny. Uh, I think Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Prokhorov and Mr. Kudrin want to create a party each. They want to create a party. Each of them will create a party with exactly the same platform. So it would make sense for them to merge. I don't think they will merge. But I think Prokhorov's achievement in this campaign suggests that he is a much more viable political person than Mr. Kudrin. Uh, so I, I can only praise uh, his achievement. And I think he's also grown a lot. If you look at his performance just a few months ago, and say, for example, two days ago after the election, he's a very conscious, confident politician who knows what he's doing, who knows how to speak. That is completely different from just seven months ago. And I think he's also gained a lot of credibility by the fact that he stepped down from that political party in summer or he was kicked out over a simple case of uh, one candidate from Yekaterinburg. He came to that candidate and he said, I like what you're doing. He, that candidate has a controversial biography, but uh, uh, he's doing a great thing on fighting uh, drug users. Oh, fighting drug, uh, drug pushers and uh, rehabilitating drug users. So Prokhorov came to that guy and said, join my party. And that guy said, uh, I will join your party, but you will be forced to drop me. Uh, and that was true. Mr. Prokhorov was told, either you drop this guy or we'll kick you out. And Mr. Prokhorov said, I will keep this guy. And he was kicked out. And I think that adds to credibility because this is a very scarce commodity. Like Mr. Kudrin stepped down over a principal issue of the issue of policy he believes in. Mr. Prokhorov was kicked out over a principle as well. And I think that makes v them very few people who can actually be credible politicians in Russia. I'll give you an insight on Prokhorov's future in Russian politics. Okay. 
It depends on whether his New Jersey Nets That's are able one. to hire Dwight Howard away from Orlando, <laughs> <laughs> give them a chance at the NBA championship, in which case he might divert more of his attention in this direction. <laughs> With that levity, let me thank you, Sergey, once again. It was terrific. Thanks to all of you for coming. We're going to keep tuned to all this debate. Thank you.